This is the How to Write Funny podcast. I'm Scott Tickers, and this time around I'm chatting with actress, writer, producer, director, Justine Bateman. I think of you as someone who has lived a charmed life. Most yeah. child stars are really troubled, and you became really famous at a really young age. Yeah, I mean, I, the whole fame thing's quite an interesting experience. I wrote about it uh, in a book called Fame, um, The Hijacking of Reality. It talks about the whole life cycle of it, you know, going up and then coming down on the backside. Um, so that is a very difficult thing to process. Yeah. My theories and since sociological theories on why the public behaves the way it does at certain points in the life cycle. Like when you're on the descent on the backside of fame where, you know, it's it's falling away. People behave much differently during that. Yeah, there's a time. lot of like sort of sympathy and pity and mm. and a little bit of anger. Like you took this beautiful thing that they gave you and what did you do with it? That's so fascinating. Yeah. So, so I think people will find that interesting. <laughs> and then in the end, and you know, it also talks about the, um, uh, how we as a society have gotten to a point, have gotten to a point where fame is, is put on such a high pedestal um, and how now social media has democratized the seeking of fame. So everybody right. can get in on it. Yep. And now the majority of the value we place on anything is really um, quantified. Uh, so we're dealing with numbers. We're not mm. dealing with the quality of something. Right. We're not dealing with the quality of somebody's talent or demeanor or anything. Or their contribution to the world. It's just exactly. how, what are your numbers? We're just, what are the numbers? Yeah, that's What so are the numbers? And, and uh, <laughs> And I think by doing that, then I think that does society a real disservice because then people are chasing numbers instead of chasing, you know, personal qualities. Right. And and then I think through that, then we miss a lot of personal qualities of individuals that would otherwise uh, rise up, be developed, and and be evident to us all, and we would all, as a society, benefit from that. So I think. I think we'll look back at this moment in society and see a real deficit of interesting, clever um, assets from people. Did you do a lot of research for that book, like yeah, academics I and stuff? Lived it. Oh well, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I lived it all, and I also, um, uh, I went to UCLA, got a computer science and management degree between. 2012, 2016. Oh, that's interesting and fun. Yeah. So the sociology classes I, t I mean, you know, and then you taking classes beside your major, of course, and the sociology classes I took, I was, I was really uh, interested to see that a lot of the theories I'd come up with my, on my own were, um, uh, you know, of course, canon of, you know, sociology theories, you know, like Goffman, the presentation of self and all of that. So a lot of that's in there, the creation, how do we create our own reality and everything. And I think at least the people that, you know, I've, I've heard from on this, it's, uh, they find it very, very interesting. But again, the, the research was that plus your personal experience of having lived it. Yeah, and just being observant. And lived, yeah, yeah, like the, the cycle of it. And when you became famous, it was a different time when there were three channels on the TV. Yeah, right? that, yeah I talk about that in the book. But yeah, so, you know, through, through being observant and through working on processing the whole experience myself through journaling and whatever, um, yeah, I was able to, you know, continue to develop as, a, as, a, as an individual. I mean, for other people, you know, it's, I mean, and when people read the book, they'll see, like, it's not surprising that... Um, for many people, it's a difficult thing to process having it, and also when it starts to go away, because it's it's such a an enormous and dramatic shift in one's reality. Um, and it's that it's not surprising. Like if if you think of other things that are in your reality, like what gender you are, what city you live in, who's in your family, um, the house or apartment you live in. And when any of these things suddenly change or disappear or are, you know, dissolving or whatever, that, that can 
create you know a huge adjustment in somebody's life. And so for a really tiny fraction of the population, fame is that way too. But is fame the only thing that you think causes a lot of child stars to have trouble? Or is it other things as well? Is it money? I is don't it, know. Um, I can't speak to that. I mean, you know. Do you, you must know people other... People don't. I mean, who knows what's going on in anybody's life? Yeah. There are a lot of people that have trouble that aren't famous. You know? Oh, of course. So, I mean... <laughs> That's uh, true. Maybe troubles, just... Maybe the odds... out there. Maybe the ratio is the same. Troubles and we out just... there. Yeah. But it can make for good comedy. Yes. And that I'm very interested in talking with you about. So when you got the job on Family Ties, which was your big break, so your big yeah, it was my, foray into my fame. My third job. <laughs> your third job. <laughs> AKA so, my third job. Yeah. And before that, you had done modeling? Uh, like for a second, just to like check out what it was like in New York. Okay. But, but really, I did two commercials. Okay. So it was your third acting job. Yeah, third acting job. Family ties. And then, but you weren't trained or necessarily had any interest in doing comedy. You wanted to be an actress. Is that right? No, I didn't even, I didn't even. You didn't want to be an actress. Well, it's not even not wanting to. I just, it never crossed my mind. It just never entered, never, <laughs> never came down on the drop down list, you know? Uh-huh. Um, I just sort of, you know, fell into it. I mean, that was my, my path. It just sort of. Uh, step into it like that. Do you get a lot of, and that's, so that's another thing I think of when I think of having a charmed life is that so many people work their entire lives to get an opportunity like that. And you were just like, eh, just fell, <laughs> fell into it, which is kind of amazing. No, I mean, things but, happen in whatever order they happen in, you know? I mean, yeah. there were plenty of years I had, it was one stretch of five years where I did not get one job off an audition. Wow. Not one. Wow. All the acting jobs I did that year were, um, you know, the, there were just a few of them, but they were like offers, like somebody I knew was running a show saying, hey, you want to come do this character arc or something, but not one audition. And I auditioned all the time. So how was that like for you? Like, how do you get through something like that? Like you said, after, after it seems like you're on the downward well, slope. I mean, I can film. only speak about my own situation, nobody else's. Um, I mean, what was happening at that same time was that I had been doing a lot of writing. Um, uh, screenwriting and um, and then digital media exploded. This around two thousand seven, two thousand eight, and I was really felt like, wow, this is what I was born for. And so I was uh, putting together proposals and writing more scripts and meeting with brands. And again, this was really early. This is, I mean, all we really had was like YouTube and NewTV.com. And YouTube was pretty new in very new two thousand seven. Yeah, in fact, there was a technical restriction where you could only upload three minutes. Mm, I don't remember And so that. everybody thought that was the model. And I was like, no, that's a technical restriction. Let's do full-length shows. And they're like, you're crazy. Nobody's ever going to do that. <laughs> Nobody, nobody's ever going to pay for that, and nobody's ever going to watch more than three minutes. Because you had to wait for the movies or the videos to download, and it was just well, agonizingly it was, slow. But there were, there were channels like NewTV.com and, and, and other places where you could upload longer. But the general consensus was that it was three minutes was the limit because that was a technical limit over at um, YouTube at the okay. time. Um, so anyway, all that was happening and, um, and I knew that the door on acting was being slammed hard for me because I had to go in this other direction. And if I had gotten like another pilot or series or something, yeah, I would have just kept doing acting. I wouldn't have gone to UCLA to get my computer science degree. I wouldn't have written this book, Fame. I wouldn't have written my second book, Face. Um, I wouldn't have written as many scripts as I've written, and I wouldn't have directed the two shorts I directed and wrote, and I wouldn't have just written and directed and produced this film, Violet, that you know is going to go to festivals right now. So Was that a feature film? Yeah, a feature film. Okay, great. Um, so, so yeah, you've been busy and it's because you didn't, it seemed like acting was on the wane for you. Yeah. I think for that reason. Yeah. Like I wouldn't have, I mean, for, for me in life, whatever my own theories you're going to hear. Um, I'll hear if, theories. If the, if I'm pushing in a direction, even if it's a direction that's been, you know, open to me in the past, if it feels like the door is shut, then I have to like step take a step back into the corridor. I mean, I'm in a corridor, right? 
I got to step back and like l- look at all the doors in the corridor now and, and look at what's ajar and then just go through the door that's ajar because who cares about the doors that are shut? I mean, either those are shut forever and not directions I should go in at all or they're um, shut now. So yeah, go through the, I mean, it's, otherwise you're going to be really unhappy. Yeah. But most people don't think of that <laughs> and they get obsessed about trying to get through the door that's locked. Well, and then they'll live that life. Yeah. And it's just a healthy attitude to try to find the, the easy way or the more pleasant way or. Well, it's not, I mean, I wouldn't say it's easier or more pleasant. It's more, um, which way is a river flowing? And if you're, I mean, just for me, like if I'm fighting the current, I'm getting really tired. I'm getting really frustrated. Um, and it's not going to be as fulfilling, let's say. It's a very Taoist way of looking Like if at the, the party's world. over, get out of that house or building or whatever and go to the next party. Yeah, it's a sensible attitude. Sensible. <laughs> So, but that's been fun for you. Tell me about some of these projects that you embarked on in that. Time. Uh, sure. I did a, uh, you can find these two, the two shorts on Amazon prime. Um, I did a short called five minutes. That was a story. A friend of mine told me that he did, you know, it was just, just, I, and I couldn't believe it at, at a, at a, uh, progressive, uh, grammar school parenting session. Um, and he told me what he did at this thing, and I just couldn't believe it. So, and, I, and I also knew it was a perfect short. That was re- with Radon Chong, uh, Brie Blair, and Rob Benedict. Great. Um, and that's when Steve Agee's in, and Isaiah Mustafa, and uh, all these great people. Um, and then I did another short that was a, a, a drama that I actually acted in, kind of a long story, but um, that's not for me. I don't like that. I don't like to direct and act at the same time. It's, it's like eating dessert and dinner at the same time. It's just like, it's just two different things that I don't, I don't enjoy doing at the same time. I'd rather just direct. Um, and then this film is called, um, you know, and then I told you about the book, Fame, and then there's another mm-hmm. book called Face that's 46 short stories about women's faces getting older and why that pisses people off. And then the film's called Violet with uh, Olivia Munn, Justin Theroux, and uh, Luke Bracey. And Steve G again. Okay. <laughs> and Rob Benedict again. <laughs> Did you write all the short stories in the book? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So was that, were those stories you'd written like over a long period and then you realized at some point, oh, this is a book? Or did you start by doing, no, I started, a book? I started knowing what I wanted to write the book about. And then I, and then I had to think about what kind of format I wanted that in. Was it going to be an academic book? Was it going to be about, um, was it going to be, you know, the same format as fame, which is kind of stream of consciousness, you know, very raw first person. Um, and then I thought, no, if I, if I was reading about this subject, I would want it to be, I would want the message to be in these, in like little short stories, like potato chips. Interesting. Yeah. So a lot of these projects don't necessarily sound comedic, except maybe the, the one about the progressive elementary school. Yeah, that's a comedy for sure. Yeah. There's some stuff that's uh, f- cry funny in, <laughs> in face uh-huh. in the short story Good. books. Um, there's a, you know, a couple of funny things in, um, in Violet, but that's mostly a drama. And then I've got other scripts that are like just full on comedies. Okay. But there, I mean, to me, comedy is. I believe you should never play comedy for comedy. You should always, it's always like it's, it's a drama. Like, well, you have to play it straight. You have to play it straight. You're winking at the audience. If you're trying to be funny, funny, it's not funny. You have to, your character has to have some defect that they're not aware of. And they, they have to be like, they're trying their best. I mean, how many times we laughed at people trying their best to, you know, transition from the living room to the patio and there's a glass door in front of them and they hit it. I mean, that's really funny. Right. I, mean, I don't want them to get hurt, but they were unaware of something. Did you pick up tips about how to do comedy from your experience on the sitcom? Or do you think you have a natural comedic instinct? Um, 
I mean, I don't know. I don't know how well you can actually teach sort of a core sense of, of what's funny. I mean, you could answer that better than me. I think I definitely came, uh, growing up, um, my mom had a, a really good sense of humor. My brother and I, you know, my brother, obviously. And um, he's more associated with comedy than you are, even though. Yeah, he's done a lot more. You both did, you know, sitcoms. Yeah, after, yeah, we both did sitcoms. But um, the work that I did after the sitcom, there was a lot more drama that I did yeah, right. than he did. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, but we kind of grew up watching like Monty Python and um, comedy like that. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like, I feel like you, it has to be in you, but, um, well, it's like, I think everybody has an innate sense of humor. Like we're humans. Humor is just part of our brains, mm. but it's the rare person who thinks in terms of doing that in a calculated way for audiences. Yeah. And, and to be able to script things. To have, I mean, I guess, I guess timing can be um, taught, though if somebody doesn't really have an affinity for it, or not affinity for it, but if they don't really have a good sense of it, it would take a long time to teach them uh, timing. But that's something, I mean, if you're doing, that's something I'm curious about with, with people that do primarily one camera comedy. I mean. If you're doing comedy live, either sitcom with a live audience or, or stage, um, you really, I mean, if you didn't have a sense of timing, you have to get it or nothing you're doing is going to work because no one's going to hear what you're saying. Right. Like if you're not using the time, you're not like balancing the timing, like when do you come in when people have laughed, you know, if you wait too long, it's dead. If you come in too early, they can't hear you. So there's just like that second you have to come in and, you know, hopefully you only fuck that up once and then you, you start getting a feel for it. Yeah. But in your years of performing in front of a studio audience, did you start to get a sense of how long laughs are, what kind of things they're laughing at, how to say your line at the right time so that you're Yeah, audible? that's what I'm saying. I mean, I, I already came into it with a, with a, with a sense of timing. But definitely dealing with the audience and, you know, you get an audience, uh, you can have an audience for a run through that's different than the audience from the tape. Right. Um, and maybe you, during run through one line got a big laugh. And so you held, 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 and then came in with the follow up line. Also, you know, you don't want to be stepping on someone else's laugh. Right. Because, you know, that'll, that'll create a bad scene <laughs> exactly. for you with other wait, people. Wait. Um, so but wait. then next time you do it, maybe the laugh isn't as long there or there's no laugh there. And I mean, personally, I, I feel like if you're going to chase the laugh, you you are going to create a, um, people are going to, people are going to know somewhere in them, they'll know, and they'll start getting arms distance to your performance because you'll, they'll know some, something in, the, in their spirit will know you're doing something inauthentic. So I think you can never chase the laugh. If you've got a big laugh on Wednesday night on that, but not so much on Thursday, whatever. You just keep playing that character. It's that character. You have to service that character and service that situation no matter what. It's like you yeah. have one foot in the character because you have to be totally authentic as that character, but then another foot that's like, you know, stepped outside that character to observe what's happening around it. And, you know, are they laughing? Should I pause here? But you're still remaining straight. You're remaining in character. Yeah, that's the I mean, skill, right? And when you're yeah, I mean that's a skill of any creativity, really. You part of you has to be able to let go completely into um, the in the creative direction, but then another part of you has to be um, has to be looking at the logistics of what's going on. You do still have to hit a mark and right. avoid shadowing the logistics. other actor and all these other things while right. you're while you're acting, you know, drama or comedy, things like that. Was it? It must have been tricky to be faced with the challenges of having to do all that when you had never done it and suddenly you're at the highest level you're like at this you know super popular network sitcom with a lot of sitcom veterans or acting professionals and it's your first thing but i never sensed watching that show you and i are probably the same age i think i was a teenager when you were a teenager on that mm -hmm. show and i never got the sense that you were any less a 
consummate professional as anyone else on that show, even though Michael J. Fox probably wasn't any more experienced than you. Mm. But the, the parents were obviously really experienced actors. Right. But it all seemed very, like, you know, totally professional. Like, everybody's at the same level. But yeah. I assume at first we were you were all a little good. intimidated. <laughs> no. No? I didn't. You just, like, rolled with it. I that's didn't what, know to be. Yeah, okay. Well, that's always I, a helpful thing. I'd only thing. been in the business for four months. I didn't really know. You figure, ah, this is how it works. No big deal. Yeah. yeah I mean, which great. is a good mindset to have all the time. You know, yeah, that's what I'm saying with the charm like, life. It's like most people just can't keep it together and but, have that mindset well, all the time. It's something it's easy to it's easier to not think that way because most people don't think that way. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You, you, it's counterintuitive I mean, it, to think it's, that way. it's you know, the, that's like you say, this charmed life position at anybody can have it if you work your ass off to have that kind of mindset yeah you cheated because so, you you worked incredibly hard for years <laughs> that's what no, i'm saying like no. nobody handed me anything so and nobody hands anybody anything right i mean you really have to you have to really work at it and if you're not willing to work at it then i don't know why you're doing this because it's it's a lot of work yeah. i mean anything in entertainment is a lot of work and I do think that what gives me the impression that you have a charmed life is the attitude that you have mm -hmm. and that you're able to maintain this very level-headedness through ups and downs and various projects, and you seem really unflappable as a person. And that takes a lot of work well, to thanks. maintain that. Yeah, it does. And, and, and it, it, it's worth it, though. It pays off. Oh, absolutely, because yeah. you're a happier person, presumably, than somebody yeah. who's fretting I mean, all the it's time. It's your life. What are you gonna? <laughs> what are you gonna do? It's I mean, your one let's chance. Say, you know, let's say you're gonna live to be eighty, no matter what. And how do you want to? How do you want to experience that? The time until then, right? You know, you could be like really, you know, very large, and you know, be very difficult for you to move around, and you could live in a place you're very unhappy at with a job you really don't like. And, you know, and I'm talking about situate, you know, if you're in situations where you can actually change these things. Right. And I mean, if you choose not to change any of the things that you are able to change, I don't know, you're kind of making a choice, right? Right. So you are most interested in directing now. Directing, writing, producing. Yeah. Oh, all of it. Yeah. And you have, uh, a uh, production company and mm -hmm. you have development deals and you're I do not have stuff? development deals. Current don't I just don't have, have my development deals are with myself. Hey, those are the best I have kind. I have like a lot of scripts that right. I've uh, written over the years. So that's my development slate right there. Great. Yeah. Are you kind of out in the trenches in Hollywood with everybody else trying to sell projects and trying to get sure. things made and stuff? Yeah. Taking meetings? Yeah. You know? i taking a lot of meetings to try and do some uh, TV directing, you know? Okay. Something I could do in between um, my projects. Have you, you done know? any of that? I haven't done it yet. I've done a lot of the meetings. Okay. Met a lot of great people. Um, but, you know, that'll, that'll come when it comes. And yeah. that, that might be something nice to do in between my own projects, you know, servicing someone else's. How is the, you mentioned in your book, you talk about, women aging and obviously that's a big stereotype in oh Hollywood in the book in face. in face yeah the way that actresses can't get hired you know once they get to a certain age do you find in directing it's similar it's is it very male dominated in tv directing uh i don't know i don't know i mean i have to tell you i have a perspective on that whole arena that's not uh politically correct maybe but let's hear it I don't really give a shit about sexism. Okay. It, I mean, if somebody says no to me, then to me it's just like if I'm water going down, you know, a river, like I used the example before, and somebody says no, then I just go around them and carry on. Them saying no means in big picture – there's, I'm not supposed to go in that direction for 
could be a host of reasons. Maybe it's going to be a very bad experience, or maybe it's going to be an experience that'll take me in a direction that's not going to be the optimal direction. Whatever it is, I'm being saved from having to work with that person. Or maybe I'm being saved from doing that right now. And maybe I'll work with those people later, but now is not the right timing for the project or for um, a, a work relationship with them or whatever. It could be a bunch of different reasons. But if they think the reason, if they are saying no because that j- they just feel like that's their impulse, and, and if they then start questioning themselves as to why, then maybe they get a drop-down menu of like, well, I don't know. I don't know. Why did I say no? I kind of like the project. <laughs> well, maybe it's because she's a female. Maybe... Yeah, maybe that's it. When the truth is like, no, you said no because I'm not supposed to go in that direction right now. If you want to then start making up reasons for yourself because you can't justify why you just said no to me, and one of those reasons is because you think, because I'm female, well, honestly, I don't really care. I don't really want to know the reason. I don't, it doesn't matter to me. And it doesn't matter to you if it's not even a reason they're consciously aware of. Which is probably how but most see, this sexism is what I'm happens saying. in Hollywood. But that's what I'm saying. The reason they're not really conscious of, the only reason I did, they said no to me is because I'm not spo- supposed to go in that direction. There no, it's, is it's no a, other reason. It's a really healthy way to look at it. And it's there's like, no other, how there's you, <laughs> just no other reason. But how do you, how do you, ex- the, reason and this somebody is, this wants, is, the reason somebody will ask, Oh, why didn't I get that part? Or why did they say no to my project? Or why didn't that person want to date me? It's because they're hoping the reason this pers- these people give will give them something that they can then fix. I see. And if you can fix it, then you can reduce... I mean, the thinking is, if you can fix it, then you can reduce the amount of no's going forward. And I say... I mean, unless you're asking from somebody who you respect, you say like, can you look at this proposal that I have and tell me if you have any notes? And they go, and if they look at it and go, yeah, you know, the graphics you're using here are like a really low res. I think if you, you know, it, and it makes it look a little amateurish. So why don't you just up res all your photos or, you know, bring in photos that are, you know, better yet, higher res to begin with, and then see how that goes. Or let me show you some of these other ones, these other proposals to look at, to compare. And, you know, that's very helpful. Yeah, very constructive feedback. Right. But I would say, get that from, I mean, know your source. Get that from somebody you respect, someone whose work you respect. Because if you're getting from someone whose work you don't respect, uh, I don't know, why are you putting yourself in that kind of situation? Yeah. So, yeah, I don't want another, I don't, or it's not like I don't want, I don't care what the reasons are. That's what I'm saying. I don't care what the reasons are. Yeah. Well, Show business, as you know, is very much a, about power dynamics. And that attitude is a very powerful attitude to just be flowing like water. And if somebody says no, you just flow past them. They're not right for you now. They're just a stone in the river or whatever. It's very powerful because well, it keeps it you in, in charge that. of your destiny. You just, just pretend, <laughs> just as an experiment, just pretend you're being looked out for pretend you have an uncle at the company that controls all of entertainment or whatever and he's looking at everything everybody's doing on his control board and he's going oh you know that company's really going in a bad direction i don't think that's going to be good for johnny i don't want johnny to go over there even though they look like a great company right now but if he, I think if he does a job with this company here and I see the kinds of decisions they're making, I think that could be some, I think that could be a really good creative situation for him. And meanwhile, Johnny's going, shit, this company, this massive company said no, but this tiny company said yes. Shit, I don't want to be thought of like, I'm working with this tiny company and I don't know, go check it out, Johnny. Maybe it's going to be rad, you know, who knows? I mean, if you just look, it's all just like, you know, your whole reality, everything is, is just whatever works for you. I mean, if it, if it works for you to get like stressed out and pepper people with questions about why they said no, I mean, if that is working for you, then do it. If it's not working for you, then experiment. 
try to pretend that you're being watched out for and try to pretend that you're being guided with no's. You know? No, it's a And see if it feels better. Attitude. If it doesn't yeah. feel better, you can go back to the other, to the stressed out way. <laughs> go back to being bitter and stressed out and anxious. I mean, really, it's just like, just experiment with what feels better. Did you develop this attitude on your own in coming of age? Or do you think you got this at an early age from like your family culture? This idea of just go no, with the flow No, I can, and I can completely take credit for it. That's wonderful. I did not get that from my upbringing more of a high strung upbringing no it was more just uh you had to discover things on your own Worked yeah out. yeah it did. but they were big i mean i've had a lot of i have a really good um i know a really good collection of people so you know it's have not you, like i discovered this on my own on a mountain oh like, sure with nobody else <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, but, none of us is an a island. Lot of, a lot of, um, you know, it's really good to talk with people that you, that you trust and who, um, yeah, it's, you know, journal, talk to other people, talk things out, talk things through, you know, try and discover. I talk about this in, in fame, if anyone wants to sort of see that kind of process, like, you know, sort of try and get to the root of why am I feeling this way or why did I just act that way or whatever. There's always some, I have found, there's always some sort of rational, ir, you know, most of the time irrational fear that's driving anything that's sort of taking me off, my, off, off being me. Yeah. Did you consciously collect good people throughout your life or have those people kind of fallen in your path in a more guided way or fortuitous way where you feel like, the universe is giving you these good people. I think everybody gets some collection of good people. You know, there might, there might be, seem to be less at certain times and more at other times. It could be an old friend coming back into your life after being out of your life or, um, you know, and sometimes it, 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 it goes in waves with a, with a, with individual people as well. Like, one person is a is a real help through, you know, your 2010 through 2012. They were real help, and then I don't know. They sort of they got married, or they started going through something themselves and stuff, and not not so much a. So then, like I said, you just like step back in the corridor and look around. You go like, "Hey, this friend over at uh, that I just started hanging out with at work, you know, they seem kind of yeah, you know it goes." <laughs> I'm not telling anyone anything new. And then you sort of put your toe into the water and you sort of share a little bit and see what their reaction is. And, you know, if it's, if you don't like the reaction, then they're just like a bowling buddy. You know, you don't talk to them about right. your stuff anymore. Oh, you, you'd be surprised. I think you are telling people stuff they don't know because speaking for myself, just like starting out, especially in the comedy industry, a lot of comedy people are really shy and socially awkward and they don't necessarily make friends easily. A lot of them are on yeah. the spectrum, you know. So, what you're talking about is like very normal, healthy social interaction where you're yeah. gauging the people flowing in and out of your life in a, in a very, like in a way that has a lot of high executive function. I mean, I don't know. I think, I think just being honest with yourself is just an important thing to do. You know, if, you know, if you're journaling or whatever, just like write it out how you're feeling. I mean, you know, and uh, so I think people also have an idea of who their support system should be, you know, particularly in entertainment. Like maybe they, they want like. it to be people who are, uh, whose work they really admire or something. And I think you got to just look around and like, as far, as far as like a support system for yourself personally, it's, you just got to, you got to take, you know who they are. You just got to. It can be, you know, and then your relationships, your professional relationships can be something different. And sometimes there's overlap, but I think to seek that out, to want all these professional people to be your support group is why. <laughs> and then I, I do think that the better you know yourself and your, mo your own motives and the better you understand motives of other people, 
you're, you're just your comedy is going to increase exponentially. The way you write it, the way you act it, everything. Because it's all the comedy is about human behavior. Like real, true human behavior. Like I think this is something that um, Lena Dunham with Girls and um, Danny McBride with uh, Eastbound and Down really tapped into more recently. Like we were getting into like a lot of snarky comedy, you know? I mean, starting with um, uh, my brother's show. Arrested Development. Arrested Development, thanks. <laughs> I mean, look, we had it with Seinfeld kind of coming in and then, and then like Arrested Development really like turned on the snark, but it was super, it was dark super and fresh, edgy right? And, like, and then all comedy like just sort of flowing that direction, right? Everybody, right. everybody, everybody. And then I feel like when Lena Dunham and Danny McBride came in with their shows, they went to another level. Because like, where are you going to go after snark? You're going to go back to family comedy? Like, where are you going to go? And they came in and the, it gives me chills even talking about it. Just the raw human behavior they were exhibiting. And human behavior with, with consequences. Or well, consequence is too big a word. Like there were results. There were ramifications. There were friendships that you didn't hit reset when you went to the next scene. I mean, you had to, you had, you got to benefit or pay for just like in life. I mean, even with a, a friend, you know, let's say you don't show up, you blow them off. Right. And then you go, Oh, sorry about that. And they're like, Oh, it's cool. It's cool. You know, the next time you make plans with them, they're going to be like kind of on edge about it. And if you're late or don't show up again, Maybe they'll never come to you and say, have this blowout like you see in films all the time. Just like, come on, that's not, people don't do that a lot in life. You do it more like this. Like you don't make plans with them anymore. You just kind of get, yeah, let them drift just, away. Or yeah, whatever. exactly. But yeah, There's a I, lot of that. So like, I see what you're let, your characters ex let your characters experience this stuff because the thing that's going to happen when somebody's watching that, that's, that's something that's grounded in reality, they'll start leaning forward emotionally into your project. And that's what happened with like Eastbound and Down and Girls. You're just like, oh my God. Oh my God, I recognize that. Oh my God, I get it. Oh my God, you know what's gonna happen with her now? Oh my God, I know how that other person's gonna react. And, and, and especially what Danny McBride did, did in Eastbound and Down, like it's, you're just like, oh my God, this guy, he's gonna, he's gonna pay for that. Like it's, there, it's there not so like much... some big Christmas movie where nobody's ever gonna pay for anything. Right. Like you're, He's going to pay for that. And he did. Yeah. He did pay for all of his behavior, but in right. such a hilarious way and in such a, your human spirit, like recognized, you know, ways that you've been like that, you know, in smaller ways, hopefully, but, or ways you've seen other people do that and seen what happens to them. I mean, nobody wants to watch something where for the joke, everything's, just like the the filmmakers are just constantly hitting reset 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 and you then you just become you're as a viewer you just become arm's length to the whole thing emotionally and then it's not that funny anymore right it's just yeah. they're prioritizing jokes over character yeah i gotta tell you so okay family ties two emmy nominations a golden globe nomination for comedy right <laughs> there were a number of things i auditioned for after family ties where they, the feedback, again, just, uh, just give me a no. I don't want to hear the feedback, but of course they can't help themselves. The feedback to my agents were, she just wasn't very funny. Ugh. And I go, to my agent, I go, they really should look at their script. Because if the script's not funny, if the script doesn't, if it's just jokes, like you said, and it's not presenting a funny, a funny slash tragic situation, no, I'm not funny. But I'm a great actress. And you're playing the character. So if you give me a character who's in a fucked up situation and we're allowed to laugh at it, yeah, I'm going to be funny. Yeah, and some of those <laughs> shows you're talking about, those characters just have a viscerally relatable foible or series of foibles that yeah. you just didn't see on sitcoms or TV prior. And I think you're right. Like That's the new thing. And then The Office was a, a benefactor of that where it was just like yeah. really viscerally disturbing like cringy. foibles, cringy yeah. human foibles that we yeah. can all relate to, just embarrassment. Yeah. And then Larry David. Similar. Oh, he's king of it. Oh, my <laughs> exactly. God. He's just king of it with Seinfeld right. and Curb Your Enthusiasm. I mean, 
So this is the standard you're trying to hit in some of your short films and in some of the projects. Well, yeah, when they on. see five minutes. I mean, I can't tell you too much about it because I'll just blow the joke and that wouldn't be fair to anybody. But is there, are, there are no, there, no, it's not. It's nine minutes, nine and a half nine minutes. minutes. Okay. But um, there are no jokes in it. Yeah, it's just character. There are no jokes in it. It's good. just the situation where you're like, oh my God, what? And I like comedy where it's not like, it's not like, oh uh, yeah, I can see where the laughs would be. It's rather, I'd rather somebody just have like a smile on their face and their mouth kind of agape through the whole thing. Like, oh my God, right? I'd prefer that than, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that's jokes. Yeah. But the other kind is, and I, I always. And similar. there could be, okay, let me, let me tell you, like, my favorite, favorite stand up is Doug Stanhope. And he's talking about, like, real situation. He's a, to me, he's a genius. He's talking about real situations in our society and real situations. It's, it's quite serious stuff that we should be paying attention to. But the way he presents it is so, um, it's so funny slash tragic. Like he does this whole run. Uh, if you remind me, I'll send you a link because I always have this tab open on my phone. He does this run on um, um, why people love the local news, why they watch the local news, right? It's and wonderful. he goes, People and he says like people are looking for any reason to just you know uh, you know it's it's you know the kind of local news news that's like which has now become every local every news yes yeah, Sinclair you know, broadcast it's whatever. ten o'clock do you right. know where your children are you know <laughs> right. uh, what are the valet parkers doing with that bottle of water in your car when while you're not in it you know all this sort of thing and he's like why don't we just see it for what it is you know they're just fear mongering they're just trying to get a rise out of you and he says because people like to think that something like that is going to happen to them. That someone is right now thinking about kidnapping their dog or their child or whatever. That, that like terrorists right now are thinking about targeting them personally. He says, because thinking the reality, which is nobody's going to do anything like this to you and you'll just carry on and have your, your little regular life and nothing of significance is ever really going to happen to you like that. Nothing's going to make, you know, the front page of the New York Times. Um, yeah, he's just saying, like, it's better to imagine that something like that will happen to you than, the, than you know, and I'm quoting him, you know, than, like, the truth, which is that you're just going to have this, just this boring life, and then you die. Right. And, you know, I mean, I think of that. It's like, nobody's going to remember me. Look at the stars on Hollywood Boulevard. Right? We work in the business, and I don't know two thirds of the names. And yet, at some point, these people were significant enough within the society of that time to give a star in Hollywood Boulevard. And there was a big ceremony, and there was a newsreel or something, thing. and all these people. And, this and I don't know who they are. Yeah. I mean, I should know who they are because I'm in the business. Right. I mean, what about people who aren't in the business? You know, maybe they know only like a, you know, a fifth of the people on. With, who have stars. Which it's is a like, very satirical point. It's very nice subtext for satire yeah. that we just want to know that we're significant. Oh my God. As Look, human social beings. media and would that, not exist without this driving need. It really awakened this terror we have of being invisible. And it awoke a sleeping giant. Oh, and that the now we have a way to be famous. Yeah. Well, because the thinking is, if you're famous, then you're not going to die, right? You're going to live forever. Absolutely. Right? And yet, look at the Hollywood three quarters of, of the stars at Hollywood <laughs> right. Boulevard. I don't know who these people's names are. So it right. it's not the trick. I guess you're just going to have to die. So it, can, that can free you because then you, then you think, well, then I might as well enjoy myself while I'm here. Yeah. I mean, I might as well stop trying to work so hard to make sure my name lasts beyond my last breath. I feel like for me, like, I don't give a fuck. I don't care if, I don't care if anybody, I don't want anybody to remember me. 
just hit reset, man. Just get, you know, in a hundred years, nobody, not, not, I mean, maybe a couple people, but pretty much nobody who's alive right now, running our government, running businesses, walking around in the street, driving all these cars, running the traffic lights, will be alive. Right. Almost none of them. We will have completely been replaced with a whole new batch of people. And they'll all start from scratch on discovering what life is about. And nobody will remember any of us. But that's very freeing. Well, let me ask you this. Or when they I'm do remember gonna... us, they'll remember us in the way that suits their purposes and their society. Right. <laughs> a lot of people who want to be famous or on social media or they want to get into comedy so they can be a big stand-up star or whatever, they're craving, and I remember that. I remember being a teenager and wanting so badly to make a mark in the world. You know, but so why? that your name is remembered. But to get what? I think it's fear of death, and I think you want to make a mark so that you feel like you're making an impact and you're going to live on. So you don't you feel worthless? Or yeah, because so otherwise? But you and I, we have, we have each done something that is going to be remembered. Like your show is in the TV Museum of Television History in New York. It's never going to be forgotten. It's been beamed out into outer space. Aliens are going to be watching your show for millennia. I don't know. People though. know what the onion is. And so I have that. So you and I can afford to say, eh, I don't care what people think, but I think somebody starting mm -hmm. out really has a visceral, just really has a powerful urge to be, I, to do something that's going to make a mark on the culture. Is I that a fair characterization? I, look, I can't speak to what other people want. I think it's important to have a sense of self-worth. Yes. I think, I think it's noble to want to um, help people through your own insights, help the current society through your own insights. But I think if somebody is just chasing fame, I mean, they should pick up the book. If they're just chasing fame, just so they can be famous, they will always be, uh, they'll never get there. And that's the very Zen thing about it. In order to get the thing you want, which but like look, you said, here, at the base here's of the it. the thing. If somebody's only doing their comedy because they want this, this, because they have this ulterior goal, look, if all you want to do is be well known, there are a lot easier ways to get there. Comedy is hard. Comedy is baking. Drama is cooking. Uh, how does that work? There's a science to baking. If you have too much of any ingredient, it's not going to work. I see what you're saying. It's the quantifiable there's a, there's steps science. and the recipe is there's very science important. science in it. Yeah. Cooking, you can vary the ingredients. You can this. flow with yeah. it. Touch it blah, blah, or I'm going to replace the <laughs> tomato with the celery and it just right. will make it taste differently yeah, good, and everything. That's a good analogy. And there's people that are good at either. But you can't really mess with... That's why I think when you have a lot of executives... Um, uh, supervising a comedy, it's not going to be funny. You need you one person with vision to you make do, it work. Because if you step all over a comedy, you just, it's like stepping all over a balloon, you're just going to deflate it. You can do it on, drama can survive that if you have good enough director and good enough actors and a writer that can like work around some, some of the notes that are taking it off track. But on comedy, you can't, you'll just crush it. You'll just crush Agreed. it. Yeah. Um, so I would say if somebody just loves doing comedy and if they had an opportunity to do something else where they'd make the same amount of money or more money or whatever, but they'd rather do this. I just feel like your path is like a rubber band. If you try to pull off your path, if you feel the stress of it and you, know, you feel like that rubber band tries to like boing, like bring you back onto the path, then just suck it up and stay on your path. Whatever it is. I mean, let's say your path is to be a doctor, but you're like, oh, but I really think I should be a famous comedian instead. You know, it's never going to happen. You know, or it's going to be, or on the flip side, if your path is to be a doctor and you really enjoy doing stand-up comedy, it's just something you enjoy doing, then do it. But take the pressure off yourself to like become famous at it. I mean, why? Like there are people that say, Oh, my daughter, want, you know, when you talk to my daughter, she wants to get into acting and stuff. And I said, oh, well, is she in like theater at school or like regional theater or doing anything like that? 
oh no no she's just like playing with the idea of like you know maybe starting to audition and everything and I said I don't know what to say if she wants to act it's she can go do it today if she wants to be a famous star it's really not it's not under anybody's control I hear that all the time people come to me and say I really have always dreamed of writing comedy and I said well have you written any comedy and there's they say no why not? Then, <laughs> well, then, the question, you, then you really don't yeah, want to. Yeah, then the question is, why not? Like right. somebody says, oh, I've not always wanted to write a book. Nobody's stopping you. Yeah, like, what's, who's stopping well, you from doing it. that? I mean, especially nowadays, my God, you, you can, can write a book and upload it tomorrow. Yeah. You know? So yeah. whatever it is you want to do, I mean, I guess you got to ask yourself why, if you're not doing it right now, why not? Just yep. give it a try. So if you love comedy, you love comedy and or you feel like this, it's, it's your path you know then just do it and anybody who would come to you and say including your own the own noise in your brain which is what violet's all about the film that i did mm. um anybody that comes to you either you to yourself or other people and says like oh when when are you gonna make it when are you gonna break through i would say uh, first of all i'd say don't be around those people anymore and i would say like you turn to them and you say, I'm doing it presently. <laughs> right. I have made it. I am at Second City doing these classes. I'm doing it. Or I'm doing what I love, so I'm a success. Yeah, there's no... The only, the only difference between sort of, in my mind, quote, making it or not making it in entertainment is like, are you, are you holding yourself back from doing it at all? Or are you participating in it? If you're participating in it, you're there. Can you quit your job right, your day job right now? No, you know, I don't even like to think of it as a day job. You, when you have a job that's supporting, where you're supporting yourself financially while you're doing something in the arts that doesn't support you financially yet. But that you love. You're just being your own sugar daddy. You are being <laughs> responsible. You are being a patron of the arts to yourself. That's all that is. And if you never, if nobody ever, if you never get on Saturday Night Live, nobody ever invites you to come on The Tonight Show, it doesn't fucking matter. You're doing what you wanted to do. You did it. You got yourself down. You signed up for classes at Second City or um, Groundlings or whatever. You put this skit together and you have all these costumes and, and you put it up and you thought you did a good job or didn't or thought you didn't do a good job and so you redid it and you improved it or you 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 know or maybe you're trying to sell scripts and you feel frustrated because they're not selling but you're writing them you're doing it timing is a whole other thing you know or maybe all the writing of the scripts is going to lead to um you becoming a comedy writer um like coach at your grammar at your kid's grammar school or something which is awesome. I mean there's so many different ways. I think the 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 whole fame thing which is it's a it's very um it's a very sort of poisonous the, the seeking of fame or the imagining that we haven't quote made it unless we're famous. I think is a real poison in American society and because it um and I think the reason it's become so prevalent here is because American society is built, generally speaking, on uh, pulling yourself up from your bootstraps and whatever that means, and <laughs> making it, you know, um, uh, succeeding and exceeding the success of the last person. Um, and if you haven't done that, you haven't made it, which is, I mean, I hope people like think that through how irrational that sounds. One thing that I think people want with the fame because a lot of people i don't know that they necessarily want the fame in and of itself there are those people but some of them want the financial freedom and the yeah. power to choose their projects that they believe they'll get once the, they're a name of course and that's that's a perfectly reasonable desire to have it is but, but I, I hope they don't imagine that they haven't, quote, made it unless that's the case. Right. Because even people who um, work in the business, who everybody assumes is just 
you know, rolling around in hundred dollar bills all the time. That's not the case. Like for myself, like I've lost my insurance with, um, you know, for Screen Actors Guild, you get insurance through being in the guild, but only if you make a certain amount of money every year. Mm. If you didn't clear that number, even if you worked that year, you don't, you know, you just didn't qualify. So I've lost my insurance more than a couple of times from that. And like, you know, I was, I'm fine, you know, financially, but. Um, Do you get residuals from the show? Yeah, but it, I, I deposited they've, a check today for 83 cents. Yeah, they've waned. You know, it goes, it's, it's on a, you know, as most right. people probably know, it's a, you know, the first time it replays, you have a lot of money, you know, it's a substantial amount of money. And then it gets less and less and less. So if, you, if your show premiered 20 years ago or 30 right. years ago or 50 years ago or whatever, right. it's less and less and less each time. And if you're a show that premiered a couple of years ago, you don't have a whole lot of residual life anyway because you don't have the network reruns, which are, you know, give you more money than the syndication reruns, which give you more money than the internet reruns. Yeah. You're not getting anything being replayed on Hulu. Didn't they renegotiate the Screen Actors Guild contract so actors are getting internet residuals now? It's so tiny. It's just super tiny. It's super tiny. That's it doesn't awful. compare at all with the kind of structure that, that we had in, you know, from like, you know, the 70s, 80s, 90s even. But you start getting into 2000 and then those residuals. I mean, imagine if you started a show in 2005 and you went, just for ease of math, like 10 years, okay, so 2015, then the internet has already exploded. And now your reruns, you know, NBC is going to be rerunning things on, you know, their own internet outlets. Right. Yeah. Or selling so, it to Hulu or whatever. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, so. I didn't want to mention Hulu because we couldn't remember if Hulu <laughs> is still an, a part owner. There's so many different studios oh, yeah, that have part that owners stuff. of Hulu, but. You know, so um, it's, a, it's a different kind of long tail to, be, right. to get in TV. But unions yeah. have been torn down in every industry. The Hollywood unions are among the strongest. Yeah. You know, it's such a very, liberal it's town. Very, and it's, very, it's very good. You know, yeah. union. It's very good. But look, all to say, you industry. know, it's, it's, a, it's a perfectly reasonable desire to have to make money at doing what you're what you love doing the most but i would say to people like but at no point should should anyone feel like they need to get down on themselves because they are supplementing their career with um, a reliable income i think that's just being a responsible human being yeah and if you're able to do what you love on the side and have fun doing it and keep doing it you're living the dream because you really are. You've isn't made really it. that expensive, <laughs> you know. You know, you've made it. Yeah. If you're doing what you love doing, you have made it. Yep. And just because people don't know your name, I mean, honestly, look at who won, you know, like Emmys in 1990 or or 1980 or you know. Yeah, they're, they're I mean, they're, they're, there might be lots of names on there that you don't even recognize. Right. It, it's it's yeah to get money. Of course, it's something that we need to do for for you know to live in this society but um i hope people can just see it in perspective you have this very taoist view of life a very zen view in america we just don't think that way we think like you said in terms of manifest destiny nose to the grindstone and your yeah, method I mean, and you you've done well in america with a very you know eastern philosophy of going with the flow well, and but you gotta you gotta work loving hard yourself too. but but working hard in the right directions let's just say you know so it's like there's an there's an economy in in the hard work i mean if we're working hard at trying to get famous that's ephemeral that is not something that you i mean if 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 all you had to do is work hard in the direction of getting famous and you got famous don't you think millions of people would be more famous now considering that that is like top level desire for a lot of people. Um, no, I think if you're working hard at becoming a better writer, I mean, one of the, some of the things I would say like for, for comedy writers, and it's so easy to do now, go either online or, you know, there are places in Hollywood, I don't know about other cities where you can buy scripts. Oh, go sure. read those scripts. Go read those scripts 
for your favorite comedy films and see how much of it was on the page. I don't mean how much they were improvising. I mean how much of the comedy was on the page. Was the comedy just, you know, um, Woody Allen's a good one to read. Like the earlier ones, like Bananas and Sleeper and, and Annie Hall. Just, just, and imagine yourself, you know, if you were a studio executive, just reading those scripts. Would you, would you think that it would be that funny? How much of it was the director? How much of it was the actors? How much of the script has to be just a guideline? Because there, and then read some scripts for comedies you thought sucked. And then read this, maybe the script was hilarious, but it wasn't pulled off by the actors and the directors, or it just sort of, you know, comedies like choreography. If you start off on the wrong foot, all the rest of it's gonna be kind of off, right? Yeah. So, you know, if you wanna get better at it, there are ways to get better at it. Um, and if you're, doing, if you're doing that, then you're, yeah, you're, you've made it. You're doing it. Yeah. You mentioned journaling a couple of times, and yeah. I'm curious to, to know about your process for that and what that does for you, because it seems like that's a really important part of your mental health, mm. journaling. And I know, I, like, I recommend people do a lot of writing that nobody sees, and it can be journaling, just like get the wheels greased and just like get all the stuff out of your head down on paper can be super helpful. What do you journal about? Is it like always like what's going on with you, your feelings, or sometimes is it like you're writing funny stuff or writing random stuff? Or and you oh, I don't, you know, I don't know. That's uh, it's different for everyone. I mean, if they're trying to get things going, like what I write about for myself personally, or just things I want to explore. As a writer, I'll write. I'll write down anything that's interesting to me. I mean, I have like, I still have like tabs open on my phone that have been open for years. Of, <laughs> I mean, seriously, years. Like people will look at my phone and go, why do you have like 35 tabs open um, of uh, things I saw in the news that I thought were just fucking crazy? <laughs> um, or ideas that I had, or something his friend said, you know, about some exchange with his brother-in-law and uh and it was just the guy said something that was so ridiculous i'm like oh my god that's a complete that's a, like a perfect basis for a character um and i'll just i'll i just keep i just i have in my computer just notes of things bits and pieces or it could be um you know like i said entire articles of of things i want to write about um i have professions that I've, you know, I've met people who have certain professions and I've thought, oh my God, what is that about? You know, what are the politics of that kind of job? I wonder like if you try to date somebody in this division, you know, or you look down on or, you know, what's that whole world like? I'm very interested in um, like the sort of subsection, subsections of society because they're all, there's little worlds in, you know, like like the little league world, what's that whole world like, you know? Or the um, sanitation world, what's that like? What kind of politics are in place there? What what happened when they, you know, when the are you know, the truck, the dump trucks that are the trash trucks that have the um, the arm that comes out that picks up the barrel and lifts it up and dumps it into the, you know, what kind, you know, that would be a great film about when those trucks came and you eliminating, now you only have a driver. You don't have a driver plus one or two other guys that are picking up the barrels and tossing the trash into the Which, back. Which, when I was a kid, that's what I wanted to do when I grew up. I wanted to be one of those trash guys who got to ride in the back of the truck. Right. And jump off and grab the trash cans. I mean, that, that right so there. Fun. I, in fact, maybe I will if somebody else doesn't beat it to me who's listening <laughs> right. to this podcast. Like, what about a whole movie about that? You know? I want to know. It's somebody for whom it's really important. It's really important to be to be on the back, you know, back on the tr of the truck. And now he doesn't have that anymore. And it's a and he remembers it for, as a child, like really wanting that because it's a metaphor for fill in the blank. Yeah, you, you know? could make the Rudy of trash collectors. Totally. Yeah, it'd be a funny movie. So I have lots of notes like that. I just write down whatever it is, and then for me with writing. I love writing. I never have a problem with writing. I don't find writing to be difficult. 
I enjoy it. I think part of that is because I will let things bake. I don't sit down. I try. I don't try to force a story out. Um, sometimes I'll go. I'll go. Oh my god, that one idea about the trash guy, the garbage man. Um, oh, I get what that whole story should be now. And maybe then I'll just write down the whole treatment, and because it's ready to be written, I wait until something's ready to come out of the oven. And same thing with writing a script. You know, I have a few uh, projects where I've done the whole treatment for it. You know, like came like, oh my god, this is ready to be put down on paper, and I'll write the whole thing out. And then, but I'm not ready to write the script yet, or rather, the script's not ready to be revealed right. yet. And when it is, then you know, then I wind up writing pretty quickly, but I just let all these things bake. Do you always plot out your scripts in treatments yeah. to get your stories broken down before yeah. you script? Yeah, I'm not going to... I mean, You're to not me, a pantser. No, I mean, I guess you could write that way. It's not a way that, that I write because there's, there's got to be a structure. I agree. I, I can't imagine. I mean, there's got to be a structure. And, I've, and I need to look, I mean, it's like, you know, writing anything, like a term paper, anything like, I got to see, like, does this all come together? I mean, I find, inner, you know, filmmaking to be very much like construction, like house construction or building construction. I mean, imagine if you just started that. Yeah, you, you just, can't like, just like, house. let's see where this goes. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, did you, did you lay the... The plumbing or the foundation or anything? No, I was just thinking of the drapes. And I just wanted really nice drapes, so I started right. with those. So you'll probably make work. something kind of interesting, but the first storm that comes will lay it down. So, you know, I feel like I want to make projects that are that have a substantial enough foundation that people can, when I'm asking them to go through something for 90 to 120 minutes, um, emotion and be there with the project emotionally, I have to give them a structure, a foundation to, to like grasp onto for the ride. If I'm giving them nothing like that, then I mean, what am I asking them to just like jump, just jump off the cliff emotionally, let's see what happens. <laughs> right. You know, and then, I mean, some films are like that. And then you get to like, you know, 10 minutes before the film is done and you go, oh my God, is this really not leading to anything? Is the lead character going to wake up from a dream? Come on. You can sense movies like that, that they were pantsing it, and they're trying to piece together an ending. And then you and get pants painful. at the end. <laughs> you get <laughs> pants. Well, again, thank you so much for your wisdom, Justine. Sure. Yeah, it's been a delight. Sure. Thank you. It's been a delight having you along for this episode of the How to Write Funny podcast. Did you know... All of the episodes are on YouTube with a fancy squiggly line that moves when the guests and I talk. They're all in a playlist, so you can just hit play and binge on geeked out conversations with comedy professionals for days. That's at youtube.com slash howtowritefunny.